And here we are. Yeah. Um, we're live. We finally made this happen. All right. Uh, my apologies for everybody out there watching. Um, we tested this many, many times. And uh, as it would happen, uh, five minutes before uh, we go to the air, everything kind of doesn't start to work. So uh, that happens. Uh, but we are live now and we're very excited uh, to have Chris Dodds with us here. Um, and as the preview sort of uh, described, Chris is one of the top nature photographies in the for, for, for photographer photographers in the world. I don't even know how to say a photographer anymore. Uh, so flustered, it seems. Um, but one of the top photographers in the world in terms of nature and wildlife. And uh, there's been a lot of interest, Chris, in having you on. I know a lot of my personal friends who are into this we're really excited uh, and I'm sorry to disappoint you guys and starting a bit late, but uh, very excited to have you here. Um, so Chris, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about first, um, for folks who may not know you, who may not know how you sort of started your journey into the type of work that you do. Give us a sense of, of that journey for you, of your history uh, with this sort of art form. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, and thank you to Vistec and to Sony Canada for uh, for having me here. And I just want to mention too that uh, while we're doing this, uh, and it's pretty pretty distracting for me because the Skype thing is new to me, and um, I'm looking at a tiny, tiny little thumbnail of myself, and I don't see what you're seeing. However, the Sony Canada technical guys are all online with us, so a big shout out to them for being there. You can um, you can post questions to the uh, YouTube. Uh, in, in real time and get answers there. And also, just a quick shout out to Sony in these times uh, with the current crisis that's going on. They've launched a $100 million US, that's 140 million Canadian dollars uh, response uh, fund for the, uh, for the crisis. So very proud to be working uh, with, with Sony um, through this time. Uh, so my background um, moved to Canada when I was eight years old and I was immediately enrolled like every little British boy into scouts and cubs and all that stuff and um, I had some terrific leaders along the way. Um, so I got to go camping and backpacking and canoe trips and got to try all different types of things and spent a lot of time outside doing that and uh, really you know, embraced and loved nature and being out there much more so than being in a classroom in school actually. Um, and then I became actually, I went right through the system, became a leader for a while as well at that time. Uh, but that just led to, you know, my first camera just to record what I was out there seeing and doing. It was a... Uh, and uh, my first picture is a, I, I would suspect it was a chestnut-sided warbler, which started the love of trying to learn more about what that little brown bird was. And it was much more colorful than a, a, a sparrow or... Um, and that's propelled that that launch into photography and birding and wildlife and nature photography. And um, and it's not always easy to get access. I mean, in terms of like learning how to be a good nature photographer and learning, you know, the instincts of like you know animal patterns. Uh, like that's something that seems. To me, it's it's not even really about the photography at this point. You really have to know your subject incredibly well, almost as somebody who is a scientist, somebody who might study that. So, um, where's that bridge for you? How did you begin to get that kind of knowledge, and how did you begin to get out there and and start to understand the world that you were what you were photographing? So I, I graduated high school in 1985. Um, and it, I remember when I graduated, I had, a, I think, a VIC-20 uh, computer. And the internet was just coming of age. So there was no Facebook. There was no Instagram to see what other people were photographing, how they were photographing, where they were photographing. Um, so it was really just about, you know, at the time, National Geographic was an inspiration for me uh, to, uh, to try to learn about a species and then do the research at the library as to where to find the species. And then investing an awful lot of time outside and just, uh, you know, learning the nature that's around you, which is a really good thing to do in these times right now with this virus. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah. the resources today are so much different with the Internet, with Instagram, with Facebook, feeds like this, uh, where you can learn a tremendous amount. And then uh, I might be jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but one of the, you know, the key ways of learning nature photography is not only to critique the images that you're making, but to go online, find a photographer whose work you like, the subject that you like, 
uh, and critique why you like the picture. If something is, this is really outstanding to me, I'm always looking at them and wondering to myself, it's a, it's a process I go through whenever I see an image, it's a critique. I, what do I like? What don't I like? And then I try to train myself to, to improve my photography still today by doing that. And I crit I'm the biggest critique of my own work. There's a flaw with every picture that I need to correct. So that's what keeps me going back often to the same place, excited uh, to see the same things and to get another chance to photograph them. And you learn, every time you're out there, you learn about behavior of the subject. So, um, and so it really is, it's available to people yeah. too, sorry. And, and what would you say, um, you know, we, we have these, we see these amazing moments, like when I, you know, kind of look at your photography uh, and you just capture almost what seems like impossible photos to capture sometimes. You know, we, some of these animals we barely even see in nature to begin with and then to get them in such a, a, a scale that you do. You know, actually I'm just looking at my offboard monitor here and I'm seeing like these two owls with their sort of beaks to beaks together in the snow and I'm just like, you know, these moments are incredible. but a lot of times people don't necessarily see what some of the challenges are for nature photographers. So for folks who might not be as familiar, what are some of the things that you're constantly up against in order to be able to get these kind of images? Because they obviously aren't handed to you. <laughs> so the picture you're talking about, I, I know the picture, it's a series of images I made um, in Bracebridge, Ontario, uh, quite a, a number of years ago. Um, and it's the two the two owls that are doing courtship behavior, and there's a whole sequence of, of of them performing this ritual. And there was an audio that was missing in the still picture at the same time. And after I, I did about 80 pictures, um, I just had to stop recording. In hindsight, um, I think if it was happening today, I would have been more mindful of paying attention, living the moment, enjoying it, as well as more um, diverse portfolio of images. Um, I remember another photographer that was there focused primarily on just getting the two heads in the image. Um, so that, of course, I can crop the image. Uh, generally speaking, I'm always trying to shoot full frame whenever possible, and that improves image quality, allows me to use higher ISOs. Um, uh, but that type of behavior, I mean, that, that's something that was really special. It's something that few people have seen, and, and you get to experience that when you invest the time and you have the time to follow your passion, whether it's a good day. And, 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 you know, there's times on uh, photography workshops when the light is harsh, uh, I see people that have no interest at all in going out. It's true, you're always going to make better images in the day, at beginning or end of a day or a cloudy overcast day, which is our favorite as bird photographers, no harsh shadows to deal with or contend with. Um, but, but just investing that time and learning the behavior and practicing, acquiring the subject and following the subject. Um, when you're using, I'm just going to talk a bit about equipment now since we're we're talking about that. Um, so when you're yeah. using, this is this is a Sony 600 millimeter G Master lens with an A9, and in this particular configuration, I like having the the vertical grip installed on it. Um, it's mounted on a gimbal head. This is a Wimberly head, and that lets you pivot the camera, and the tripod supports all the weight, and it's really easy to drive the camera. But when you're using this kind of focal length or when you pair it with a 2x teleconverter to make it a 1200 millimeter lens, like you often see in my images, I use that setup, um, it really does take some practice when a bird's flying past to be able to align your lens, the camera, and your eye object and follow the subject. So harsh light is a great time to practice that. So I'm always, even today, practicing really, really often. And one of the things while we're talking about it to make it easier when you set up your camera you'll notice I always have it set up at eye level. Mm. And that means that I wear glasses normally. So if it was down low, and I'll just mimic a lower angle, I'd be looking down and the, the frame of my lens would be in the way. And now that I've aged with progressive lenses, I might be in the wrong part of the, of the lens on my glasses. Um, so really important to line that up. And then when I'm setting up, you know, one of the important things is deciding what altitude I'm going to set up at. Because very often you'll see that I'm down low, low angle, low perspective. That really makes it an intimate view. So when you look at the still portfolios, the still images on my, in my portfolio, the portraits, you'll see I'm at or below eye level just to get really intimate with the subject. Um, what do we? St I just got sidetracked on what we've started the conversation with, but I might as well just keep going with the equipment. Uh, this is a one to four hundred G Master lens. Um, it's mounted to an A9 without the vertical battery grip. So this is a really 
manageable lens is a second lens. It's often on a strap, a black rapid strap on my side. So I can manage these two lenses at the same time. Um, what's remarkable with this, lens, this camera and lens is the speed of focus acquisition and its ability to track erratic, fast-moving subjects. So going back to the summer of 2017, I had my hands on the first 1 to 400 and A9 that came to Canada to take on my Puffin workshop to test. And, um, you know, Puffins are incredibly erratic flyers and uh, it's really hard to track and acquire focus. And one of the tricks you can use if you're not using an A9 when you're photographing them um, is determine the distance that your subject needs to be to be big enough in the frame to make an image that you would call a keeper. Mm -hmm. And then choose something, and often when you're on a beach and the birds are coming from the water, you can back up so that that distance is where the water line is. And in between each sequence of shots, you just aim the camera. You don't even have to look through the camera. Aim the camera down at the, at the shoreline there, pre-focus at that distance, so now you're much more ready to acquire the subject that gets that close. Um, and then, you know, other, other tools in the arsenal now, it's, this is an A9 II with a 200 to 600 millimeter, which has since come out um, recently. I had this um, for puffins again to test it. What's remarkable with this 2 to 600 millimeter lens is it has all of the optical quality of even sometimes, you know, it's very comparable to the 600 f4. The autofocus means there. It's very manageable. It's heavier than the 1 to 400, and I just find it balances more if I have the vertical grip on this one. But that's, that's the, the sacrifice I make to get the, the easy one-handed grip if I need to while I'm concentrating on protecting this, this equipment from maybe falling over or something. Uh, or working from a boat as well. A uh, quarter turn to go from 2 to 600 millimeters, which is really easy to zoom and follow something that's coming towards you. Uh, if you say, well, Chris, you know, I'm just starting out. I'm not sure if this is something I'm really going to embrace. Uh, it's something I want to try, and I don't really have any equipment. You've got the Sony RX10 Mark IV. It's got a 20, uh, 24, I think, to 600 millimeter lens built in. It's a Zeiss lens, really good quality. It's got all of the autofocus capability of the A9 built into this with 22 frames a second, I believe. So this is always a camera that I have under the truck seat when I'm out and about, and it's something that's always available if I see something that I wasn't expecting to see. And it's, it's always above my head in the RV when we're out driving around the RV. Um, another option, too, for support is a monopod. Um, you'll see me using this. This is a Wimberley, a brand new head from Wimberley. It's a monopod head. Um, it's side mounted, so you actually turn the whole. This makes it one handed. A lot of people like it because it's it's easier to manage than the three legs of the tripod. The only thing I don't like about a monopod is when I have an expensive rig like this mounted to the top of it, it's it, it needs to be held. I can't let go because it'll fall over, right? Uh, and then when you want to put it down to use your 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 camera that's on your side, um, it's often awkward to manage. And, well, so I just I like the reliability and the the, the support of the tripod. If I could ask you a question too about that, because when it comes to supports and camera supports, uh, how much of what you're doing is park it and you're there for a while and how much of it is like almost chasing the action like running around and being like oh we got like so i could see in a situation where a monopod would obviously be helpful where you have to move quick and like kind of follow the action and then obviously something like your 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 big gimbal support system there that is for when you're just parked what percentage are you parked what percentage are you typically running and, and gunning so to speak yeah, it's it running and gunning. I mean, things like spring migration. So you're uh, Point Pelee National Park in May. Sadly, it looks like the park will be closed this year for that. Uh, but it's something that many, many Canadian photographers, international photographers look forward to. Uh, it's one of the top 10 birding spots in the world. Um, so there, you know, you get out in the morning and you're on a tram and then you're out in the woods and you go to the tip and you wait to see what migrants come over Lake Erie uh, through the night or early that morning. Um, many more if there's been some weather during the night uh, that forces them down and if it's fine weather they often skip peeling and just keep going um, but but that just means that when there is no big influx of new birds you have to go out and find them so you're wandering around the woods that's where the 200 to 600 uh, over the shoulder rig is really going to excel the other advantage is uh, the minimum focusing distance so the big super tellies they have better minimum focusing distances than, than they ever have had but the 2 to 600 or the 1 to 400 allow you to focus much closer, which means 
when you're on a crowded path, when you're at a world famous uh, sorry when you're at a world famous uh, birding location there is times when there may be a lot of people trying to get a picture of a rare bird some of them today have uh, phones cameras that are making great pictures Sun comes up, it warms up, it starts to rest, it's hydrated, it's got some food, it starts to move quicker. That's what the warblers do, they're very quick moving. Um, when they're on a branch and you, the first person to get the picture, often with a shutter, a mechanical shutter, would be the only person to get a picture because the noise of the shutter would scare it away. The Sony mirrorless cameras, it's absolutely silent. So. The last two years, increasingly, I had like two years ago, I had probably 75% of the people on my workshop using uh, Sony cameras. Last year was 100% using Sony cameras. And that meant that we could all get up there and get relatively close to the birds, take pictures and not even disturb it. It would never, it wouldn't flinch, it wouldn't twitch, it wouldn't move, it wouldn't be uh, scared away. Um, I got a question actually from our comments section here. We've got uh, uh, Steve Wartz asks and um uh, Chris, what focus area do you use for BIF? BIF aviation. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Um, so I'm using the tracking autofocus, and I typically like working with the with the S or the small area. There's a lot of people that are, you know, feeling their way around the Sony autofocus system, and a lot of other people are coming up with other combinations. There's so many choices of uh, of autofocus modes and the way that it works in the camera, um, I find that to be the best. So tracking uh, and the flexible point S. So um, with the animal, I activate it as well. Uh, say that again. I didn't catch that, actually. What did you just say? So, sorry. Yeah, with, with, and Sony has animal eye okay. autofocus. So it actually locks on the eyes and tracks this, the, the eyeball, the closest one to the subject, unless you tell it otherwise, um, uh, close one to the camera. Um, and that works for mammals, works for some birds, not all birds. Increasingly, it's getting better and better and better for birds in flight. Let's, uh, I kind of want to take a little bit of a, a, a side step here and just kind of work back a little bit because we talk about all this amazing technology. Um, but at a time when you started photography and doing this, it was likely the analog generation. Uh, it wasn't into digital yet. How much has the advancement in technology change the work that you do and um, you know what can you do today that you just simply couldn't do 10 15 20 years ago so and that's a really good question um, so it, obviously at the beginning I mean it was it was um, it wasn't so long ago that I was tracking birds in flight with manual autofocus um, and without an autofocus lens uh, which is if you think about that, that's incredibly. The thought of it today scares me because my eyesight's changed, my reflexes have changed. Uh, I probably wouldn't be uh, be making a living at it today without the autofocus systems. Well, in fact, that's another. It's, I've got a list taped to the side of my monitor here, uh, Dale, that uh, of things to remember to talk about today. One of them, you know, one of the one of the biggest uh, tricks to get the really razor sharp wingtips and be able to zoom in and see every detail and vein in the feathers is using a high enough shutter speed. So, assuming a lens like this 600 f/4 behind me, um, I'm going to shoot wide open most of the time, and that does that'll blur the background and make the subject really pop. Uh, so shooting at f4, uh, if I want to be at five thousandths of a second, you know, if if it's a dark day, I could be up there at ten thousand or twenty thousand ISO, 
and the images speak for themselves without noise removal and then if you add a little bit of noise removal um, the in images are just insanely good so that's that's for me being able to photograph birds in flight and have the camera pretty much do it you know it's important to have a deeper understanding of the fundamentals of photography it's important to remember teach yourself to remember that you want as high a shutter speed as possible aim for five thousandths of a second to really freeze those wingtips um, but then you know people talk about the noise in images at high ISOs and and then then in exposure becomes important having the correct understanding of exposure so being able to look at the histogram on the back of every camera including even phones these days um, understanding that the whites are supposed to reside on the right hand side and the darks are supposed to reside on the left hand side the camera has enough dynamic range to retain detail in the darkest darks and the lightest lights if you properly expose and keep it within the edges but you want to push it all the way to the right without it touching small um, bald eagle the white head with a dark background um, you may not populate the histogram so then you turn on the flashing highlights that feature flashes and said hey these these pixels are overexposed so those are all things you couldn't do add to that being able to preview the image on the back of the camera which when I was when I first started out I am self-taught so I had to make notes in a notebook save up money I used to cut grass and shovel lawns to uh, shovel snow to uh, to save up the money to buy the roll of film and then to send it off to be developed and they would inevitably switch the rolls of film the notes would mismatch and I'd have to start again from scratch to learn that way um, and and that would you know sometimes be a month later when I got the pictures back to try to learn from them today not only can you see the picture on the back of the camera with the Sony mirrorless cameras it's remarkable because so I've talked about having a camera on the side and being able to swing it up and take a picture quickly so the last trip I was on uh, at the beginning of March was photographing eagles in Alaska so that happens a lot throughout the day when you're when the, the eagles are fishing, you're picking up the, the handheld camera and zooming in on it. Uh, and what can happen, I always shoot in manual exposure to get the most consistent exposure and correct exposure. So it's really easy to turn a dial by mistake, if you've got gloves on or if your hands are cold. When you look through the viewfinder, what you see is what you get. So if it looks extremely dark, you're underexposed. If it looks extremely bright, you're overexposed. It's apparent as soon as you lift the camera to the eye. So that's another huge advantage. So not only do you get to see on the back and show your friends immediately, you get to see live in person. You can also, if you want to, project a histogram inside the electronic viewfinder because it's such high resolution. You can have it in the lower right-hand corner and you can actually see your exposure values uh, live in the uh, histogram. Um, that's a, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the technology is really, especially when you think of like, autofocus and the animal eye autofocus, I mean, it's just making it easier and easier to be able to get those really dynamic shots, uh, you know, in, in a much less period of time. Like you talked about, you know, having to go and send your film away and get it developed and then you'll only know a month, you know, a week later whether you got the shot or not. And you're not there anymore, obviously. So to, to correct that. Um, I do want to uh, actually just out of pure curiosity, ask you in terms of if you could sort of, um, uh, place in order the animals uh, or the subjects that are the easiest to generally get a good shot of and some of the ones that are the more difficult ones to get a good shot of uh, a, a general understanding so if people want to go out there and they want to start uh, you know getting quick wins uh, or they want to invest more time uh, to know sort of what they're up against and where the quick wins might be and, and where the, the investment of time might actually be and so that, that's that, another question I often get asked is, is you know, Chris, you're, you're known to be a bird photographer, but really I'm a wildlife photographer. Um, but birds are everywhere and birds come to feeders. So we're all stuck inside here in Quebec at the moment. Uh, I mean, we are going in our backyard um, and that's a great place to go out and start. To, there's always something to photograph. If I was a wolf photographer right now, there's no wolves in my backyard, so I wouldn't be doing very well. Um, so birds in general, I mean, I love the challenge of even identifying some of the birds. So the hard ones for me now with the different plumages are gulls. So I spend a lot of time photographing gulls of any variety and then trying to identify them. And that even in bad light, that gives me a different challenge is just the identification uh, with the different plumages. Um, if, if, you know, there's, there's people that, you know, like photographing bears, but again, 
they may not live in a place where there's bears in the backyard. So, you know, just feeder birds in the backyard is a great place to start and then start thinking about the purchase instead of having the bird on the, on the, on the feeder platform, uh, which is a nice place to start, you could add a perch. When you add the perch, you could, you could say, okay, the bird always comes from this direction and it's always perching the wrong way. Then you could put a second, maybe a tripod or another stick to try to lead the bird progressively down, per, you know, they'll perch at a, a tree nearby before they come and perch at the feeder. Um, so you can think about then what your background is. Is it the neighbor's fence or their house or is it the sky or is it your lawn or what exactly is the background? Um, but I mean, my personal preference is I love spending time with bears, with any, with any animal or bird really. Um, it's kind of a hard question to answer more in more precise detail to give you a, a hit list because geographically the feeder birds change. Um, you know, if you're in British Columbia, you may have uh, great jays or Canada jays coming into your feeder, uh, where you're not going to see that here in in, uh, in 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 part of Quebec. I mean, anyway. Uh, but we do have a flyway coming through where all the migrants that I'll miss at Point Pelee this year will be coming pretty close to my house. That's all the warblers and songbirds that migrate uh, for in spring migration. So, looking forward to that. Um, and then spending time out and about in the neighborhood and talking to people to see what they've seen. Um, there's farming communities nearby, so that means that, you know, there's a red fox nearby. Often a neighbor will tell us about a den uh, where you could go and spend some time sitting in your car as a blind or set up a little blind. Um, and I'm going to ask a, a couple more questions from the audience, but I also just want to make a quick technical mention. I understand that when I... Uh, cut to just your website because your Skype is not embedded within that audio stream. Uh, we lost your, a bit of your audio. It wasn't up there long, uh, Chris, so nothing to worry about, but my apologies to the viewing audience for that. Um, and uh, I've got two other questions. Uh, one quick one as well, just from our friend uh, Steve Wirtz again, asking if uh, you use auto ISO when you are in full manual. Another good question. No, full manual means no auto ISO. It means manual ISO. Basically what I'm doing, if you think about it in terms of, of studio, black background, you see my skin color now, um, and the color of my shirt, the color of the camouflage here, that's all accurate. We have one light source. I actually have an LED uh, light above me. Uh, it's one light source. So the, the, the reason the exposure changes, if I lift my hand up, you probably can't see the top there, but it's over, it's really cooked up there because it's closer and the further away I get, um, the less light is falling on my hand. We don't have to worry about that with the sun because we're on the surface of the earth and the sun is up there and it's shining down or there is something between it and the subject, which could be uh, an object which would cause, cause shade like the canopy of a tree or a cloud and varying degrees of cloud cover. But once you establish what the correct exposure is, then what you see is what you get. Black will be rendered black and white will be rendered white. The only consideration is if you photograph a black subject like a raven, uh, you want a portrait of its head on the snow, uh, you can overexpose the snow by as much as a third and a stop, third and a, a, a stop and a third, sorry, um, and uh, re get more detail with less noise just because of the way the camera records light the way we see light. It can see light, it can't see mm -hmm. darkness. So that's when we're talking about noise again and the camera's ability to record detail throughout an image, the important part is the darks. And so if you're always underexposing and correcting, you can get away with a lot. The files are really forgiving, the software is really good, and the sensors you're starting with are really good, but recording that properly to start with ensures that you have much more detail with less noise. And uh, we've got actually another, thank you for that, and we've got another question uh, from Tom Garnett. Tom wants to know, um, and this is actually very interesting, something I never really thought about, have you ever used flash with a modifier uh, such as a better beamer, which I've, or et cetera, which I've never heard of. And I, before you cut in there, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, outdoor adventure guys that are now using really powerful strobes to reach really far distances that they weren't able to do before. And that's another sort of technological leap. Are you introducing any of that into your photography and how does that affect the animals if you do? Okay, so the better beamer that he's mentioning is a Fresnel lens mm -hmm. um, held by two brackets in front of a flash. And that flash, when you're using a rig like this, we used to put a, a bracket up here and have an off-camera shoe 
and then project that light. And what that would do at the beginning of digital cameras and when we were using film, there wasn't enough detail recorded on an overcast day. So the eyes looked like there was no reflection in them. They were just black and void. So you could put a little kiss of light to fill light the shadows, which the first digital cameras had a lot of trouble recording shadow detail without a lot of noise. Um, so you would, you would negate that. You would increase the amount of light in the shadows, open up the shadows, have more detail, record more detail. You would put a little catch light in the eye to give su the subject some life. What I find with digital is I'm, I'm using less and less. In fact, I haven't used flash for a long time because uh, we can record so much detail that even on an overcast day, cloudy, bright day, I can bring out the detail of the shadow of the horizon and the sky in the eyes, which really make it look lifelike. That's how far we've come now. Um, that said, those light sources you're, you're mentioning, though, uh, it's really intriguing to me to have a constant light source. So a lot of those, those flashes are LED, and instead of just doing a burst or a pulse of light, which would require me to switch to a mechanical shutter, I can use it as a floodlight that's always on, like we're doing here now, and use that to fill the shadows. Particularly, picture a really rainy, overcast day, an eagle flying over the water, the dark sky is reflected in the water, so it's all dark, and there's like a vacuum of light underneath the eagle. If you had a light source projected in its direction, the, the water would kick it up and fill the shadows and make it a much more interesting oh, picture. Cool. So that, that's where I see this right now. Um, I want to kind of switch gears. We've got about 20 minutes left, and I, I want to talk a little bit about more behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of environments where, you know, for example, you know, you could be out in you know, a warm summer day shooting, and that's great. But a lot of the environments that I see you're in are, are either winter related, um, they're in, you know, more challenging environments, that type of thing. Let's talk a little bit about how you prepare for some of these trips and how you, uh, in terms of your clothing, in terms of these other things that you might be packing and putting in your bag that aren't necessarily related to your actual camera, for example. Good, good question. Um, my hands, I have Renaud's, which means I get white fingers when it gets, for no reason. It's an unexplained phenomenon, basically. Uh, if you cut your finger off, the blood vessels restrict blood flow naturally uh, to preserve your core. And so that happens without me having to cut my fingers off. So I, in the winter, I'm spending a lot of time protecting my hands against frostbite, which is a really dangerous um, side effect of being out in the cold. Um, and I spend a lot of time now with clients in workshop settings where I'm having to spend time looking out for them as well. So the first thing I do is I start with uh, the mo most important part of my body, my hands. So hand warmers, they're uh, inert basically. They're not a chemical, although people call them chem chemical hand warmers. It's vermi vermiculite, carbon, um, and uh, iron. And so basically what causes the heat is a rust. It's rusting or oxidizing. Um, so I'll put in the colder days, I have one in the palm of my hand with an overglove, a thin overglove, just to hold the hand warmer there. I'll put a second one to the blood supply to my hand. And then I put that into a big mitt with another hand warmer. Then my toes are the next important thing. So I generally have really uh, uh, highly rated Arctic footwear uh, with uh, uh, mountaineering type wool socks. Um, very, I don't have to wear uh, feet warmers as much because generally I am moving, but if I'm going to be standing around, I will put feet warmers in as well just to keep myself warm. Uh, and then I wear uh, base layer uh, thermal uh, merino wool layers, sometimes even multiple, and then fleece windproof um, hoodie. And then I have an Arctic down uh, jacket, which is really light and packable and really, really warm. And then, of course, full balaclava and uh, head protection as well. Um, the one consideration with footwear is that when you see a manufacturer talking about, you know, boots that are rated at minus 30 or minus 40 degrees, that keep in mind that's assuming you're a certain level of, of activity. Uh, so if you're standing still, of course, your feet will still get cold um, if you're waiting for something to happen. Uh, if you're not taking the extra precautions of wearing really thick socks and sometimes feet warmers. Have you have you uh, gotten to a point or, or done something where in the course of the last, you know, decades or so of your career that you made some critical mistakes early on and uh, sort of learned like it's a mistake you see happen with a lot of people going into the backcountry and, and trying to shoot and how did you rectify those issues? 
I've been pretty lucky that um, in my own circumstances, you know, I always mention in the, the paperwork I send out to everybody with the equipment list for my workshops, you know, just think about the fact that you could potentially be on your way somewhere, stop the car in a Canadian winter, I'm just going to grab a shot, the car's running, often as Canadians we're in the car with just our shirts, we take the coat off for the drive, so you jump out to take a picture, what if you lock your keys in the car? That's that's one consideration, and you know, we're if our coat's in the car, generally our phone is in the car as well, so that's something that runs through my mind every single time I step out of the vehicle. I mean, I've I've spent a week um, reminding people that it was icy that week for an owl workshop, and I got home in the driveway. I was so happy to be home after the week. Uh, I jumped out of the van, and and I did, my feet slipped out from under me. I kicked the bottom of the open door and, and fractured my leg, and broke rib at the same time. Um, so that has happened. Uh, but I think the biggest thing to to overcome is as as you you know turn professional, you have to start thinking about how a professional conducts themselves. So I remember once I was at a service counter um, for a camera repair shop and uh, there was a, a person who presented himself as a pro photographer. He was gonna sue the brand of camera that he had in his hand because the autofocus stopped and he got no pictures. And so I instinctively asked what he was supposed to be photographing and it was a concert. Well, a professional in my mind, A, would have a second camera as a backup at least uh, but also be able to manually focus something like a concert to get the images that he was required to get as a professional. So I always try to think of that. And key, key for me is all, and never leave home without spare memory cards, battery that's charged. You know, before I charge my batteries and all my cameras the night before I go out, um, and inexplicably, once on a blue moon, you, oh, I didn't turn the camera off. And so it's stayed on, and that camera's depleted, the battery, and uh, and then you have a problem. So I always have that backup. Cool, a cool uh, consideration with these mirrorless cameras as well is that they have a USB port on the side, so you don't even have to carry around the charger that comes with the battery. You can put a USB phone charger into the camera, and A, charge the batteries that are in the camera. B, assuming you, you go out without any battery at all, if you can scrounge up a portable power supply for a, for a battery backup for your phone, you can run your camera off that. So that's another advantage if you end up somewhere like St. Paul Island in the Bering Sea between Alaska and Russia where there's no camera store, your luggage doesn't show up, you don't have a charger, that's your saving grace. And speak, uh, kind of on that line, we actually got a call or a, a question from Richard Baxa um, about how do you manage uh, media backups and all that sort of stuff in the field? What are, what are some of your strategies around that? Okay, so I so I use um, a combination of cards um, because because these came out before the tough series of cards, 128 gigabyte um, card. So why 128? Why put all my images on one one CF card? First of all, I can have a second one in the camera and have it duplicate the first one if I want to. I choose to load it with two of these cards to double the capacity. It overflows onto the next card once one card is full. And I choose to do that instead of handling smaller cards with the possibility of having to expose my fingers in the freezing cold, drop the card through a boardwalk in a marsh or into the mud, uh, off a boat, into the snow, uh, or lose the card. Uh, but after the shoot, especially in the cold, an interesting consideration is when I'm done shooting, I'll take the battery out and the card out, put them in my pocket, zip it up, make sure it's secure pack the camera into the bag and leave it that way until the next day when I set up. Then I have a charged battery and a formatted memory card to put back in the camera the next morning without ever exposing my camera to all the humidity from condensation, from entering a warm hotel room from the cold. Um, so then I get into the hotel room at night, I'll use a card reader, a fast card reader, download this onto an external SSD, make a duplicate copy of it, uh, recall the images, that I'm not going to keep because very often I'll take a lot more pictures than I'm going to keep. Uh, generally, I know which ones I'm looking for as I'm photographing. I know which ones I'm going to keep. Uh, so I'll go through quickly, find the pictures I'm going to keep, delete the rest, copy them back onto a compact flash card. Now that one stays in my wallet with me all the time. So I'm never going to, if I get robbed, if I lose a, something, the um, you know, hotel room gets robbed, car gets stolen with all the gear in it. I have the images for the shoot for the trip in this, in, in, on the card in my wallet. Uh, so back up to another SSD, so that's two copies in the room plus the 
memory card. And when I get back to the studio at home, I'm putting it onto an IO-safe duo, which is a, a relatively new uh, uh, RAID array in a fireproof and floodproof enclosure. Uh, so it's it can there's a NAS version, non-NAS version, um, technical side. So I'll start with that, and then I have a, a NAS version, a much bigger capacity that everything goes on to. And it doesn't matter if my house burns and the fireman shows up and floods it, those images are protected. They're also on uh, duplicate copies out in a detached garage, uh, in a gun safe, and uh, and bank safety deposit box as well. Wow, yeah, that's it's your lifeblood of your business, so you definitely need to be secure in multiple locations. <laughs> There's a, no question about that. Um, I have a few other questions, um, but we do have one last question. This ISO topic is very interesting to a lot of the wildlife folk, um, and we've got Anthony Gomez here asks, um, would there ever be a need to preset your ISO? So assuming you, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but perhaps, you know, to have a lower preset and then maybe a higher ISO preset and be able to quickly toggle back between the two or, um, or maybe you understand the question differently. So, yeah, and I can explain that. So um, a good example is you're photographing birds in flight, the puffins on the coast, the upper north shore of the St. Lawrence in the Gulf a little island where I go, and uh, the clouds coming and going. So you've got that you know, beautiful. beautiful blue sky, and these puffy white clouds keep annoying you with your exposure. So that's two different exposures, one when it's cloudy and one when it's not. So it's when your subject is in the shade of that cloud, the exposure changes. And so, yes, you can program your camera so that you could set up two ISOs and toggle back and forth. Generally, because I'm a person that tries to minimize things that I have to remember on the camera, keep my muscle reflex and memory active and engaged and something I can rely on, I can fall back on. I generally don't do it, but you can do it with the uh, with the Sony cameras. So yes, that's uh, the explanation behind that. I, I hope I've made sense. Absolutely. Um, you've, you've not only in the past, but uh, hopefully obviously you're going to continue this, but you lead a lot of courses. I know that for a lot of wild, wildlife photographers, that's sort of uh, a really big important part of their business is, is being a, a trip leader and a guide and, and helping people and assisting people to get some of those great images. Um, in all of the, the trips you've taken and all the courses and workshops that you've led, are there some like, I would say like two or three main things that you find you're saying time and time again or teaching time and time again um, that uh, is just always these commonalities around advice for people coming out on these trips and, and trying to get these great images? There's so many things that I say over and over again, but I'll just try to give you some of the, the ones that come to mind now. So, so just recently in Alaska, you know, we've got eagles fishing in front of us and swooping down. And every time after the sequence, I notice instead of following through, it's going to be a chase between two eagles. Because let's face it, they love stealing prey from somebody else or eating garbage much more than they do getting wet and having to work themselves. So there's often chases. So when I'm shooting the eagles, I'm gonna follow through for a chase. And I look at everybody and they're all looking at the back of their camera. Um, cool thing with these is, in any type of weather or brightness, it's hard to see the LCD screen on the back. So I actually set up the C3 button. So it toggles between showing me everything here or here in the, in the EVF. So I can review images, zoom in, see the histogram, set the menu items all through the EVF. And that's the way I choose to do it all the time because it's always really easy to, to see and it's very convenient without having to shade and try to, to see with the glare on the back of the camera. But my, you know, that number one thing is the best action happens and everybody's looking at the back of their camera chimping and chimping is like you know, being a chimpanzee looking, you know, looking at something and checking it out instead of photographing. So that's the first one. The second one is, you know, people even that know better, a lot of really, you know, people are really good photographers with this equipment these days. And they just, for some reason, are unable to continuously remind themselves to check exposure and check the critical sharpness and then let the rest happen in front of them and record it. Um, so, you know, the second is, you know, you'll, you'll see what they're, they're shooting at and you'll say, hey, you know, you, you're like a stop underexposed. No. And then they look and they, oh my gosh, yeah, I am, you know, and they just weren't paying attention. Um, pay attention to other people when you're photographing with other people instead of jumping in front of them. Always be courteous to other photographers. Uh, not, not spending your time chasing the wildlife around. If, you just, if you're just still and calm 
and relaxed, wildlife will come to you. Um, often in Alaska, when I do my bear boat trip, uh, I'm not quite sure if you're still yeah, there I or am. not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure what was that? So, um, so with a bear boat trip, often what will happen, it's a place that people have been visiting for a, a long time. The bears are really habituated to the people, and there's there's a lot of trust built between the bears and the the, view, the people that are viewing the bears and photographing them. A place like Hallow Bay in Alaska, and, and so in this circumstance, I, I can see you're zoomed in. I think on on the two cubs playing uh, in the grass. So it's a foggy morning. The sun is starting to burn off the fog. We we actually got, almost got lost transiting from the ship to the shore in a small skiff, a landing craft. But we were able to re regain our bearings with the help of a captain guiding us with his sonar or radar from the, the, the mothership. Anyway, so we, we top the crest this hill and go over into the meadow and there's these uh, the mother and the cubs. They actually came to us. Um, so if there's a boar around, the big boar bears like to eat the, 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 uh, the babies. And the mothers have learned over the years that if they're close to a group of people, that won't happen. So they tend to be very trusting of us. Um, and uh, I've got another... Uh here um let's see here oh uh, this is a great one actually one that uh i haven't put too much thought into but uh what type of filters uh or do you use any filters uh, that help you enhance uh your photography so for the most part i don't use filters at all including um uv filters for the front element of the lens so a lot of people buy them to protect their lens any lens is engineered from the ground up including the hood, the elements inside, with digital cameras, chromatic aberration is a thing, where light can enter into the elements of the lens, bounce around, hit the white sensor in the back, and that creates this little glare, it causes fringing around dark and light colors that meet, as an example. You get like a cyan or a color, a magenta color. Um, so if you add something that wasn't part of that original design in front of the, the lens to protect it, you're actually degrading image quality substantially. So this lens, there isn't even a place to screw a filter in um, on, the, on the front. But it's designed with that in mind. So a repair on this, a minimal repair, would be just repairing a scratch or a broken front element. Um, and it would be comparable to whatever it would cost for a really high quality filter, but the image quality would be better. But I see that a, a lot of times people are using those lens, those cheap uh, ultraviolet filters to protect their lens, and uh, and I always suggest they remove it. You know, um, uh, this is a really interesting question that we got from Mo here, and um, uh, Mo asks uh, if uh, or how is it possible um, to be able to do any type of hunting at the same time as photography? And this is kind of interesting because a lot of people who are uh, who do a lot of wild game hunting and things like that are obviously they know as much about animal behavior as you know you may have and and so uh, any advice or any experience with the hunters coming to you and asking that type of question as well yes in fact and uh, you know it's really interesting to see the progression of those people or the ones i know about that are diehard hunters and i don't have anything against hunting it's sustainable and it's you know it's responsible hunting um, but they'll start out that way. They'll start carrying a camera, start improving their photography very quickly because they already have the field craft. They already understand what animals, you know, how they behave, how to approach them, and where, where to find them. Um, and they have patience. They'll often sit in blinds and, and wait for things to happen when they're hunting. Um, and so a lot of I have friends, uh, Jeff Moore comes to mind, um, being on a bunch of my trips, um, you know, and he also – Making it, making some money from selling hunting related images to hunting related publications while he's at it as well, so that is another you know that is another. Uh, so it is something I see, and and generally as I say that transitions from hunting hard, die hard hunters to die hard photographers. Um, and let's let's talk a little. Let's take a, a, another little diversion here and just talk about some of your most memorable trips. Um, and maybe this might also put some of these places on the radar for folks as well who might be looking for ideas about when when we're allowed to travel again, uh, where we might want to go, and uh, and the type of things that we might want to seek out. So, uh, what are some of your most memorable uh, experiences? Oh, there's so many over the years. Um, you know, some of my favorite trips are the annual trip for the bears in Katmai, Alaska. Um, the, the, um, going back to the bird side of things in Quebec, where we have a gift, it's Bonaventure Island 
so it's a national Parc National, which is a, a provincial park actually in in uh, in Gaspe, Quebec, the town of Percé. It's a trip I'm going to miss in June this year. Um, so there, you know, there's there's uh, thousands and thousands of of gannets, which is a beautiful white seabird. When they dive, they 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 put their wings back and they look like an arrow diving in the water uh, to fish. Uh, there is a few pic gannet pictures on the website there. I can't I can't really see what you're looking at, but it looks like you're scrolling around looking for some. Um, so it's got a cinnamon color head with the blue eye ring. Spectacular birds. They do all of their courtship behavior. You can get really close to the to the birds. And just being there for me is being alive, seeing, you know, the windier it is, the more activity there is. By the way, birds always land and take off into the, into the wind. So another part of learning is learning a little bit about weather and how to interpret it. Um, you know, so if it's sunny, point your shadow at the subject. If it's windy, you always want the wind and the light to come from behind you to be most successful, to have the birds landing at you with the light shining on them from the front. So Bonaventure Island gannets uh, boy the uh, you know uh, st. Paul Island and the, the Privilof Islands in, in Alaska it's between Russia and Alaska it's uh, if you've ever seen deadliest catch it's uh, it's where they bring the catch um, so I get to go there usually in most most summers uh, working off cliffs and seeing things like crested uh, uh, sorry tufted uh, puffins horn puffins crested auklets least auklets parakeet auklets Arctic fox I think the first picture you had was an Arctic fox uh, with the wildflowers around it from St. Paul. Um, and then there's just so many places. Uh, in Quebec here, there's, uh, there's um, Bay des Fays, which is a, a popular spot right now for the snow geese. Um, Point Pelee in the spring in Ontario. That's Leamington, Ontario. It's about four hours drive from Toronto. Um, I haven't been there lately, but there's the Leslie Sp uh, Street Spit, which I'm sure a lot of the people viewing this know about, if they're if they're into uh, Toronto area wildlife. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, pop in here and, and ask uh, another what I think is a really important question. So one thing that I want to bring uh, people who aren't aware of uh, to show them about is that you actually run a very popular blog called the Nature Photography Blog. Um, and it's a, an amazing resource in terms of uh, sharing your experiences and uh, a great, you know, for people who are looking to get into it and that type of thing, which I think is awesome. Um, in terms of other websites or other books that you can suggest for people who are looking at, you know, upping their craft, um, what resources are out there for folks while they're having this downtime? What kind of research can they do uh, to be able to help their craft once they can start to get out there again? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the Alpha Universe uh, website, the Sony website. Uh, places, places like Vistec, I, more and more uh, you guys are doing a phenomenal job of spreading the word and offering uh, education and uh, this type of interview. Um, I have classes for improving your Photoshop or editing skills. Um, and then also it's an opportunity when we're trapped inside, you know, for the diehard uh, photographer in one genre to, to poke around and learn about other genres of photography um, that they can start learning about. So Alpha Universe, Vistec, I mean there's so many uh, resources now that are actually unlocked and available for people to, to view for free uh, where the, normally there's, there's a charge for them. Um, I, I think just a good Google search would, would point you to some. I don't, I don't usually have a lot of time to invest in that so I'm somewhat, somewhat limited in, in my, the time I have to uh, to cruise. Although I'll be I'll be doing some of that in the coming days. Um, an interesting question here from uh, Mo as well. Again, um, now even though we're we're very happily having this conversation um, because of your relationship with Sony, uh, and we're very excited about Sony products. We recognize that not every photographer out there uh, is on that system. And we have a question about Micro Four Thirds, and um, I don't know if you have any experience with shooting Micro Four Thirds, but if you have any advice for lens lengths, focal lengths for people who are on that system. That's a good question too. And yeah, you know, you can go out there and do, you know, this kind of photography with any, any brand of camera. Um, so my experience in, in, in micro four thirds are mirrorless cameras as well. Um, so there's a lot of advantage to that. And the smaller sensor means that you get more bang for your buck. It multiplies for free the focal length. So in other words, 
This is a full frame camera. It, I get 600 millimeters and it's a 600 millimeter lens. The micro four thirds would give me a multiple of that focal length, so it would increase the range. And so, one of the things I appreciated that I had tested before switching to Sony uh, was just the, the quality of the 1 to 400 millimeter lenses that are out there forms, and you're getting much more reach than 400 millimeters. Uh, the downside for me was always that the EVF blackout. So every time you take a picture, the electronic viewfinder, the, the TV screen that you're looking at inside the viewfinder, excuse me, would go black. Um, so if you're following something like a snow goose going from left to right, it's a pretty predictable path for birds in flight. It's quite easy, even though it goes black, 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 black when you're taking pictures. Um, something like a puffin coming in where it's very erratic, uh, it's a lot more difficult when every time you take a picture, it goes black. Uh, that said, though, not everybody um, is out there photographing erratic, small, fast birds. You can start... Uh, places like Florida, there's so many places to go with wading birds that fly slowly and they're big like herons and uh, the big waders um, that you don't necessarily need all that. Uh, but that's another advantage with the A9 is it's, there's no blackout at all. It's very easy to follow the subject. Um, we've got about five minutes left and uh, we'll kind of keep an eye on here to see if there's any other folks want to chime in with the question. But um, you know, you probably give a lot of talks as well. Uh, some general advice for folks of all levels. You know, there's probably people tuning in right now that are very experienced um, and very accomplished, but also some people that are just curious about this. Uh, any any type of advice that you give to sort of a wide ranging uh, group of people uh, in terms of the getting great at, at this craft? So, with it's like anything. Um, the more you do it, the better you get. It's that simple. So if it's if it's action that you're photographing, practice photographing action and every aspect of that. You know, if if you're doing portraits of people, the more practice and the more time you invest in learning lighting, whether it's natural or um, um, LED lighting, uh, studio lighting, um, practice and try and go out there on a limb and, and take some chances. Uh, the more I photograph a subject, the more chances I'm going to take. In other words. I'll use a longer focal length knowing I'm going to click, clip some wings uh, with the hope of getting the full frame image without any cropping at all. It's just a personal challenge to, to improve. Um, so again, oh, and always be ready, you know, if you're photographing, I've got a list of things I'm trying to get through here uh, before, before we're finished. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to talk about was expected, unexpected, ordinary, extraordinary. So how that relates in what I do is when I'm photographing a bird that is perched, I'm anticipating it taking flight. I'm anticipating another, raptors often stoop or, or dive bomb each other. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in anticipating that. Because I can use such high ISOs and get amazing image quality, and a lot of cameras do that today, um, then I'm using a high enough shutter speed to, to be prepared to freeze any action that might happen, including the launch. There's some pictures on my, you'll see a bunch of pictures on the website and the portfolio site uh, where you'll see the, the wings up from a launch. That's how I did that. I got the portrait first and then waited without having to worry about changing settings uh, to go with the higher uh, uh, shutter speed. Um, and then when you're at a site where there's things like puffins flying, it's easier to photograph a puffin against a white sky on a cloudy day. It's much more difficult to follow it and track it against dark backgrounds like wet cliffs and such or green out of focus grass, beaches, etc. Uh, but always try to remind yourself you know, I've got 4,000 pictures of it coming in with the fish and the white sky. Now I want a couple with different backgrounds and different circumstances. Um, and then... Well, I was yeah. going to say, we've got a, a, a bunch of... <laughs> suddenly a, a swath of questions have come in. So uh, we've only got a, a, a few more minutes. We're going to go a little bit over time here because we start a bit late. Um, uh, and I'd like to just uh, get these questions uh, addressed. So from Garand de Clerc, um, we, Grant would like to know um, what your outlook is in terms of social media in this platform. So how much are you using social media now um, to promote your artwork and uh, which ones are, what platforms are you on? So you'll find, you'll find links to these on my blog, by the way, but I'm on Instagram, um, Facebook, uh, my blog. Um, I've dibbled and dabbled with Twitter, but I don't really get Twitter. Um, I don't seem to get the, uh, the engagement. And uh, Facebook is uh, changing. it. Every time I think I've got the engagement part of it down, uh, I lose a lot of ground. So it's always uh, it's something that I've sort of uh, 
put in my agenda to spend the next uh, weeks in quarantine here in lockdown, um, uh, learning more about. Uh, but I think, you know, it's it's it, people are evolving too, and they're not engaging as much. They're skimming through um, posts instead of interacting with them. Um, so it's up to, it's up to us to learn how to to engage more. But generally speaking. You know, it, it goes without saying that the most engagement comes from the most the images with the most visual impact, and they're usually action shots. They're usually eagles and owls, and you know, uh, uh, things that are you know the the the, the, the kingfishers diving uh, that we've all seen in the in the press and the media and winning competitions lately. Uh, they tend to get the biggest uh, engagement. And I understand too, like. Uh Further to that, because you lead a lot of trips, uh, I know that there's a, a few different sort of outdoor people that I follow, and social media has been super big for them because when they lead a trip, uh, their trips fill up like really fast because their reach is you know beyond what it used to be before, say Instagram, and and so they've being able to build that audience. I don't know if that's helped you in your business as well, but um, is that something that you've seen? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. And, and the more effort you put into, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm noticing there's more traffic on my website, a combination of the current circumstances that we're all stuck inside for the most part uh, and, and have more time. Um, but also I, I have more time to be actively engaged with it because when I'm traveling, uh, any downtime is, is uh, really valuable. Um, and, and often it's not practical to interact with social media, whether it's, you know, a, a cell phone mm -hmm. connection or a data stream or yeah. Or, or whatever. One last question here before we finish up, uh, and I think it's a great one. Um, Tom Garnett asks, do you have a favorite medium that you prefer to print on? And that's that's great because, you know, my images are never finished until I've made a print. Um, lately, I've uh, I have 65 inch um, TV, um, 4K TV monitor. Uh, I've been using and loving that. I never thought I would get into that, but I, I do. Um, but generally, I mean, most of the most of the uh, the wildlife images, uh, it's typically just an Epson, uh, like a premium uh, weight um, semi gloss paper, um, the Hanemuel um, and the Ilford um, premium papers as well. I have a big inventory of. Um, but I tend to be, I, you know, I have a vast collection of papers that I try and test, but I tend to always go back to the old standards. The, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that most of them are still matted and framed. Um, so, you, you know, that's that's a big consideration there. So there is some economies with going with like a premium semi gloss. Well, that's uh, that pretty much wraps up our time, Chris. Thank you so much for uh, for making the time. I know. You know, you're not super busy at the moment, but uh, we still appreciate uh, this. And we and I want to uh, give a big shout out and big thank you as well to Sony for, for helping us connect. Um, and uh, for everybody who joined us on the chat and asked questions. And uh, again, this is our first one. So I know there's been some technical uh, difficulties in terms of buffering and things like that. Uh, and uh, we'll get that all sorted. But uh, everyone else tells me that it was still a great watch. So I really appreciate everyone who joined in and asked questions. And uh, thank you, Chris. I look forward to seeing uh, what you can do more once we're all uh, released out of our houses. <laughs> yeah, let's hope for a speedy recovery to this. Everybody stay safe, stay, stay away from other people and keep your distance. Thank you, uh, Dale. Thank you, Sony. Thank you, Vistec. Uh, thank you all for, for taking the time out of your busy lives to, to tune in uh, and, uh, and watch. And uh, I look forward to the next time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know. And I just want to remind everyone that to uh, visit your website. We do have a link in the description below to both of your sites, the Nature Photography blog, as well as uh, Chris Dodd's photo.com. Is that that's what it is? What, what it is? Yeah, Chris. Hey, look at that. I've looked at it so many times. I have it memorized now. Uh, so thanks so much, Chris. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, until next time, bye-bye.